Amen. Thank you, Brother Dylan. Thanks again for joining us this morning. If your Bible, open to the book of Esther, if you would. Open to the book of Esther this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for your good ministry and music. You are singing well today as a congregation, lifting up your voices, and that encouraged my heart. It was a good, a good sound to hear. I have not quickly forgotten those services when I was here with just a few folks, and it's great to have the people of God back together again. But do me a favor, don't get too silent on me. All right, we need some amens every now and again. I know we're not down south, we can still say amen. Amen? amen. Okay, there we go. And uh, the, 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 uh, the problem is I've seen a lot of you at a sporting event. I've seen some of your moms at a sporting event. When I first got to First Baptist Church, I was coaching soccer, Brother Ashway, back in 2002. And I had three moms there at that sporting event, three wonderful moms that I made sure they went to every game because I needed just those three moms and they would cheer louder than any other fans, any other cheers that other fans could throw at us with those three moms. So moms don't sit there and say, I don't know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just dainty, Pastor Howell. You're dainty till your little one gets mauled over in a soccer game. And then you become undainty. And uh, so we can have just some of that at church. If you get excited about what the Lord is doing or what's, what's going on, you can say amen. Amen? I'm glad to be here. That can happen when you're at home for a while. You're sitting in your lazy bowl with your coffee and the pajamas. And we prefer you not to bring your pajamas and your lazy boy to church. But uh, coffee's okay. And everyone knows that's in the Bible, right? <laughs> Hebrews. Okay, never mind. We won't go there. Wow. I, I digress this morning. Look at Esther, the book of Esther. The great time up at Man Up Camp. Thank you for all the men uh, who came up there. Just a great time with some of these men. And uh, sit around a campfire, hear some testimonies. Boy, I love to hear how God works in lives. And I learned some things I had not known before about some of the men in our church. And I love that. Good things, wonderful things. And so I'm excited for that. And thank you, Pastor Scott, for all your help with that, with Man Up Camp, getting that coordinated. Esther chapter 3 this morning. We began to look at this last week. We look at the book of Esther as we look at our theme, I Believe God. Help me, our theme this year is, I Believe God. I'm coming back to that theme because that's our theme. And I want us not just to know it's on the wall, not just to be able to say it, but maybe, just maybe, to be able to live it. I can't think of a more opportune time in the world that we need this theme, I believe God. Things are out of our control right now, but not out of His control. And we're safe because we choose to believe God. I believe God. We looked at Daniel, we looked at Paul, and now we're looking at Esther. A wonderful example of faith in God. Someone said, well, the name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther, and they are accurate in that accusation. But the hand of God is all over the book of Esther. You cannot nearly turn a page or read a column or read a few verses and not find God's hand at work, just like He always is. You may not see him right now, but he is still at work. He sits in the heaven and works all things at the counts of his own will. God is in control. Whether you acknowledge it or not, or like it or not, or believe it or not, guess what? God is still in control. Book of Esther, we see the hand of God at work. We saw in, in chapter 1 kind of the background for Esther. We saw in chapter 2 kind of the uh, uh, of how God called out one of his own, Esther, and then Mordecai. In chapter 3, we, last week, we saw the enemy, the enemy of God's people. His name is Haman. I want to look at chapter 3 again because there's an attitude of Haman that I'm afraid gets us. And it's an attitude of anger. An attitude of anger. Are you an angry person? Well, no, Pastor Howell, not for the wrong reasons, just for the right reasons. That person should not cut me off on the road, I tell you what. I'm angry for the right reasons. One little girl said this, When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. <laughs> Wisdom from a child. An angry person. In the spring of 1894, the Baltimore Orioles came to Boston to play a routine baseball game. But as the story goes, what happened that day was anything but routine. A fight broke out between uh, the Orioles player John McGraw and the Boston third baseman. 
Apparently the fight uh, transpired, or the way it quickly grew, and it grew from just two players to both teams fighting, and then quickly went into the stands, the grandstands, and before long all the fans were fighting each other, the teams were fighting each other, and of course those two players. They ended up setting the ballpark on fire. And as the story goes, the ballpark burned to the ground. And along with it, another 107 additional buildings in Boston. Over a baseball game! All right, well, pastor, if it was football, I get it. But baseball, no one gets that. <laughs> Yet anger, sometimes the silent killer, sometimes the loud killer. They say, I, I found this, this is not original with me, I did not make up these statistics, but this is what they say about ang anger. That the average woman loses her temper three times per week. The average man, six times. Women get angry more often at people and men at things. Probably a fair statement. Now what did this hammer do to you? <laughs> Everything! It swung itself all by itself. Women, they say, tend to be more verbal with their anger and men more physical. Single adults express anger twice as often as as married adults. And the place where you're most likely to express anger is at home. We often become more angry with those we love than with strangers. I want to look at this morning in the book of Esther. We'll read chapter 3 and we'll look at Haman. Haman is not a saved man. Haman is not a, spiritually, a spiritual man in the regards to Jehovah, probably pagan spirituality, but not spiritual and, and God-like spirituality. Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Haman, in this chapter, we're going to see his anger and what is, how his anger led him, how his anger began to destroy people and a race of people. And the fact is this, we often mimic Haman more than Mordecai. We often mimic Haman more than Mordecai. Are you guilty as charged? Let's look at Esther chapter 3. And after these things, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him? And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. We looked last week what that means. And how when those two words are used in conjunction in Scripture, bowed and reverence, they're only used in relationship to our worship for God. Last, when I was studying the week previous to last week's sermon, I was trying to discover, find out, does God really explain to us why Haman didn't bow down? We know it was a spiritual thing, but does he explain it to us? And someone had, had, had presented that maybe it was because Haman had an idol on his clothes, and that's very possible, but Scripture doesn't tell us that, right? Someone else said, well, it's because Mordecai was bitter, because he wasn't promoted, and Haman was, but Mordecai wasn't in the, in the promotion line. He wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have access to that spot. That wasn't his spot. But if you see those two words, bow and reverence, anytime they're used together in Scripture, besides this time, they're always using connection to reverencing and worshiping Jehovah. This was a spiritual thing. Haman said, no, I can't bow and worship you. You're a mere man. I only bow and worship God. Verse 3, then the king's servants, which were in the king's gates and the Mordecai, why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. See, Mordecai didn't answer the question. He just said, I'm a Jew. That was his answer. I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm reminded of a church that we're well of, Pastor Paul Chapel, who was told they could not sing in their worship service. Many of you may have seen this. He posted, though, that he said basically to the governor, we have upheld everything you've asked us to do, but when you begin to tell us we cannot sing, sing is a part of our worship to our God. We will sing. Haman, or Mordecai said, I'm a Jew. Verse 5, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman 
full of, help me, what's the last word? Wrath. Not just he became wrathful, but he became full of wrath. He became angry. He began to seethe. He began to fill with indignation from the very depths of his soul, full of wrath. Are we more like Haman? More like Mordecai. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, help us during this time we look at your word. Lord, help us to hear your truth in our hearts. Would your spirit speak to us? Lord, help me this morning to speak and communicate clearly those truths from your word. Lord, may we not miss what you have for us today. Would you help us to respond and be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who does not know that they're on their way to heaven or under the sound of my voice online, Lord, would they see and hear about your your redeeming grace and the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and would they trust you today? Lord, help us during this time. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. We look at this morning how Haman became angry and then give you a few thoughts at the end. You know the situation. It's not a secret, but Haman was promoted, and, and now in his promotion, everyone was supposed to bow and worship him. It was not just a mere act of obeisance. There was some worship involved in this act. It's a bowing and reverencing because that's why Mordecai wouldn't do this. There was no law among the Jews that you could not bow to a potentate, to a king. It wasn't a problem to bow. It was a problem, though, to bow and worship. Haman was promoted, and, and I see, first of all, Haman's offense. Apparently, first of all, Haman did not notice that Mordecai was not bowing down. The servants, the other servants, saw it first. Because that's what the scripture tells us in chapter 3. That, that when the servants saw the king's servants, they asked Mordecai first, Hey, why aren't you bowing down? Well, what are you doing, Mordecai? We all bow down to Haman. You heard the king. Why aren't you bowing down? He says, I'm a Jew. That's all he says. And I see Haman's offense, first of all, by others. Whoa, you know, you're, you're offending Haman. And they went and they told Haman about the offense. Be wary of people who would seek to influence you to anger. Haman, did you know that Mordecai wasn't bowing down to you? I wonder if they were seeking maybe to gain favor with Haman. He was second in the kingdom. Maybe they wanted to be the, the golden child to, to Haman. Haman, uh, we want to let you know, Haman, that uh, we bow down to you. Well, we do what we're supposed to do, but uh, oh, Mordecai, he's not doing that. Mm -mm. We know that uh, apparently he asked, well, what's going on? And they must have told him, well, he's a Jew. Well, Haman had to see it for himself. Not only here, he saw it. This is what the Bible tells us in verse number 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not. I wonder how that went down. I wonder if Haman went on a little hunt. Right? Apparently he hadn't noticed it for a little while. All right, the servants noticed it first. But I wonder that he said, okay, that's it. I'm going to put this to the test. I'm going to see what happens. And he went and maybe he, he walked past and kept his eye turned right toward Mordecai. And when he saw it, the Bible says he became, or he was, full of wrath, or he was offended by it. He was offended because of personal, a personal reaction. He got bound down to me. He wasn't offended for the king. The rest of the book tells us that. He wasn't offended for King Ahasuerus. He was offended because Mordecai had insulted him. Why else would you build a gallows yourself? unless you're personally offended. Haman was offended at Mordecai personally. Be careful when you get personally offended. I'm reminded of a, a time a, one of my friends, or a long time ago friend, said, well, I was out at Black Friday shopping, and this lady cut in line that had been staying there for a while. My friend's story, and they said, but it's okay, I got her back, I need her right in the leg. Now, maybe you felt like doing that before. Personally offended. Do you not know you can't stand next, closer to six feet than me? Back it up. Personally offended. Be careful when you're personally offended. A lady once came to Billy Sunday and tried to rationalize her angry outbursts. She said to Billy Sunday, you know, there's nothing wrong with me blowing my temper. I blow up and it's all over. Billy Sunday wisely responded, Yes, 
and so does a shotgun. But look at all the damage it leaves behind. You see, we see Haman's, we see Haman's offense, then I see Haman's reaction. He was filled with anger, boiled over the top, can't think of anything else I imagine, just begin to seethe in his mind and in his heart. And I've met some people like this, maybe you've met people like this, and maybe this has been you before, where you just can't think of anything else, can't process anything else, you can't believe that that person or that situation, they'd have the audacity to do that to you. Don't they know who you are? Don't they know who I am? They should have known. He's filled with anger. Then he had foolish action. Look at verse number six, if you would. And Haman, and he thought it, he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Understand that at this point, Haman begins to react in anger like an unsafe pagan person will. And unfortunately, like a fleshly Christian can. He says, you know what? It's not enough for me just to take out Mordecai. It's not enough just for me to deal with this personal offense. I am going to destroy every single person who is a Jew. Can you believe that? One man does not bow and reverence him like he thinks he's supposed to have. And he says, that's it. I'm going to wipe out every person associated with him. Whether they know him or not, whether they agree with him or not, whether they know anything, I'm going to wipe them all out. Wow, what an unbelievable, foolish action. Kind of like road rage. Kind of like road rage. That person cut me off, so I will smash them with my $20,000 truck. That will teach them. <laughs> Read a account about two men driving down the road in road rage, back and forth in California, until a young girl was on the sidewalk, and one hit the young girl. Game over. Foolish action. And 2009, a 27-year-old woman from Fort Pierce, Florida, walked into a McDonald's restaurant and ordered a 10-piece McNugget. Now, right there, you know it's a bad story. <laughs> right there. I don't know if it was the McDonald's or the McNugget part, either place, you know it's a bad story, right there. Apparently, the person behind the counter had informed this lady, young lady, that they were out of nuggets. The story goes from bad to worse. Apparently, this lady became so irate and so angry that she took out her cell phone and called 911 to complain. I wonder how that phone call went. 911. What's your emergency? Is that what, how you ask your brother Asher? Something like on those lines, close enough, right? Yeah. What do you say then? You know what? I'm at McDonald's on Dixie Highway and they are out of nuggets. Apparently the dispatch operator got her off the phone. So she called back again to 911 to complain about lack of nuggets at McDonald's. Once again she was uh, kicked off the phone call and the third time, the police finally showed up and gave her a ticket for misusing 911. What did you think was going to happen? Send the police, all right, send the McNugget ambulance. We need some McNuggets and get some here. Foolish, foolish, foolish reactions. One time we had a student. They're at school, they got so angry that they punched a block wall. Broke a couple knuckles. Block wall's fine. Still in the school, still holding up the side of the wall where it was before. You can't hurt that block wall, that block wall punching it. Foolish actions. Be careful, Christian, when you're tempted to become angry. If you operate in anger, you will often 
operate in foolish actions. Things are said in anger that have no place being uttered in a Christian home out of a Christian mouth. Foolish actions. Things are thrown in anger. I'm talking about Christians right now. Thrown in anger. Tossed in anger. No place in a Christian's life. You see, too often, or sometimes, or often, we're more like Haman than we are like Mordecai. Let that anger come in. I'm personally offended. Can you believe what they did? They said this. They acted this way. That's not right. So I'm going to fill in the blank. See Haman's reaction. I see Haman's plan. He used his platform. He, he, took, he went to the king, the Bible tells us. He told the king in verse number 8, And Haman said unto king Hazarias, There's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. There are four things that Haman asked for. Number one, he already said, first of all, he said they're different. These Jews are different. They're weird. They don't have the same laws. They have diverse laws. They're a little bit different. Can I say something, Christian, as a side note? I hope that people know that we are different. And I hope they know, just a side note here, I hope they know that we answer to a higher authority. That this says they're different and they're disobedient. They don't keep the king's laws. They seem to answer to another king. Well, my friend, we do answer to another king, and that's King Jesus, creator of the heaven and the earth. He's a lot better king than any earthly king. He says this at the end of verse number 8, Therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. They're a detriment. They're causing these problems for you, king. Remember this. We're going to come back to this verse. And then he says, We're going to do, I want you to destroy them. He says, King, can we destroy them? In fact, I want to wipe them out. I'll give you 10,000 talents of, of silver for the king's uh, coffers, basically. So King Ahasuerus King Ahasuerus gives Haman the ring and the money and says, do whatever. So Haman writes a law. They published, and they look in verse number 15, the post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. Verse number 15 tells us that after all this was done, Haman was content. He went and he ate. He had a party. He sat down to eat and drink. He's fine. And the city was said, what? What just happened? What just took place? Have you ever observed an angry individual and they do something crazy and you're like saying, they're like, whoa, what just happened? What was just going on? This is what the city did. What's going on? I want to give you Three warnings from Haman today. Three warnings. Three warnings that I think will help us operate in the spirit, not in the flesh. The first thing is this. Be careful of people who will lead you down an angry path. Be careful of people who will lead you down an angry path. I referenced back at the beginning of the story where those servants came to Haman and began to influence him toward anger. Christian, my friend, be careful of people who will lead you down an angry path or wind you up and point you. Parents, be careful when your kids want to wind you up. Let me say that again. Parents, be careful when your kids want to wind you up. I'm not the principal any longer. I have a whole lot of stories. I can't tell them yet. Maybe a few more years. But I can say I've seen, I've seen parents, the good parents, who take what their kids say with a grain of salt. God bless those parents. I strive to be one of those parents. But your kids know what frustrates you. Your kids know what buttons you have, don't they? No, not my kids. No, sir, I can see them coming. Right. I've seen parents wound up before. Of a situation maybe that didn't happen at all. Not even accurately. Kids with their parents. Be careful if people lead you down an angry path. One young mother and a little boy were driving down the street. The little boy asked, Mommy, why do the idiots only come out when Daddy drives? Be careful of those friends 
and I use that term loosely, those friends who will lead you down an angry path. It happens personally, and that's who you complain to, isn't it? The ones who you know will take your side. You don't, you don't complain to the people, you don't complain all those offenses to people who will tell you the truth from God's word. That's not who you're complaining to. You're complaining to people who you know will take your side. What, they said that to you? That's ridiculous. I can't believe they said that. How could they treat you that way? You have every right to be upset. Be careful. Be careful of those people. I want people in my life who will look at me and say, Howell, stop it. That's why I need in my life. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Be careful of people who will wind you up and point you toward anger. It happens on social media all of the time. People post something. And typically the comments that go are people that agree already with that or, oh yeah, can you believe that? Uh, just in a side note with social media, I don't believe you ought to use social media to, to complain about your day. Right? That's not the platform to complain about your day. If you have some complaints of the day, talk to Jesus. Because my Bible says casting all your care upon him. He'll probably say something like this, in whatsoever state you are, you should be content today. It's probably what he'll say back to you. All right, because he's already said that in his word. But don't complain on social media. People do all the time, right? Oh, anybody else feeling sad today? This is what happened. Here's the comments. Oh, wow, that's terrible, right? I'm reading the inflection in the, in the comments, of course. How could they? All caps. Right? Don't put up with that. Be careful of people who will lead you to an angry place. I want people in my life, friends in my life, who open God's word and say, wow, is that a spiritual reaction? I'm thankful for a godly wife who does that for me. Or I'll say it this way, sometimes the Holy Spirit lives right next to me. Sometimes husband and wives can wind each other up, can't they? Right? <laughs> Sorry, honey, you're sleeping outside. I can't, uh, I can't be around people who make me angry. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I'm saying, of course. Be careful of that. And surround yourself with people who want to please the Lord, who want to honor God. Haman had these servants and they were just pushing. Be careful. Be careful at work. Be careful at home. Be careful with your kids. Be careful of those who would seek to lead you down an angry path. Number two, be careful not to become angry just because of a personal offense. A man and his wife once pulled into a gas station to refuel their car. The tank was being filled. The gas station attendant came and washed the windshield. When he was done, the driver of the car, the man, said, Well, the windshield is still dirty. Do it again. Yes, sir, the attendant re replied and washed the windshield again. As he scrubbed the windshield a second time, he looked closely for any bugs or dirt that he might have missed, but couldn't see anything. When he got done, the driver again said, It's still dirty. Wash it again. The careful attendant washed it a third time. Very carefully, very, uh, with such care and concern. Uh, but still, uh, still the, the windshield looked dirty. By now the driver was fuming. Apparently he screamed, this windshield is still filthy. I'm going to talk to your boss and make sure that you never, ever work here again another day. You're the lousiest windshield washer that I have ever seen. He was about to get out of the car when his wife reached over and grabbed his glasses off his face. And quickly brushed the glasses and put them back on his face and the windshield was now miraculously spotless. Be careful that you don't get offended over personal offenses. Because sometimes, many times, usually, those glasses are pretty dirty. Haman, obviously not a saved man, Obviously, Haman didn't have the mind of Christ like we have, but far too often we act and respond more like Haman than like Mordecai. We act more like Haman than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was rejected, yet he accepted. Jesus was mocked, yet he loved. He was falsely accused, yet he was silent. He was physically assaulted, yet he had self-control. He was betrayed, yet he still forgave. They act like Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, Wherefore, my beloved brethren... Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Be not hasty in thy spirit, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. 
Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruled his spirit, that he that taketh the city. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Be careful, be careful not to become angry just because of personal offense. It'll happen today. It'll happen tomorrow. Anger reaches out to us all of the time. The last thought is this today. Foolish anger causes more harm to us than to anyone else. When I was studying this passage, it really struck me how Haman went after all the Jews, right? He said, they're different. They're disobedient. They're a detriment. They need to be destroyed. Haman was dead set on destroying all the Jews. And he said this phrase, I told you we'd go back to it. Look in verse number 8, end of verse number 8, where Haman said, Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. But I can submit something to you this morning. Haman missed what God had. I'm reminded of a little promise that God gave through Jeremiah, command of the Jews, where he said this, Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons. And give your daughters husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. That came in Jeremiah at the first captivity, roughly 70, 80 years before, before the story of Esther took place. And God says to the Jews, he said, listen, seek the peace of the city wherever you're captive and pray for that city, giving them the idea that God would bless that city for in that city's peace, the Jews would have peace. What I'm trying to say is this, Haman said, these Jews, there's no prophet king for the whole country because of these people. And yet they missed the fact that the prophet for the city was found in God's people. Haman was about to cut off his nose to spite his face. He wanted to destroy the very people who had the ear of Jehovah. The very people that could have actually benefited the city in a true spiritual manner were the Jews. The very people he sought to destroy were the very ones that could bring blessing upon that place. And Haman didn't even realize it. See, God's the only source of blessing, true blessing. And Haman, in responding in anger, wanted to destroy the very thing that would ultimately save them. Someone said this, of the seven deadly sins, anger is probably the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come. To savor the last tooth and morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back, in many ways is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Anger. Simple question. Are you more like Haman or more like Mordecai? we have anger, we're like Haman. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Well, thank you for this truth from your word. Lord, we need to model your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, these truths, Lord, sometimes they touch us pretty close to home. I wonder this morning if there's someone here who says, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. If I'm going to be honest, the fact is I'm more like a pagan named Haman. I respond in anger. I don't operate in the spirit of the flesh. I operate in the flesh. My reactions, my personal offenses. Would you pray for me this morning? God spoke to me. I need to do business with God. Would you pray for me this morning? He says, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me. Amen. 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 Who else? Pastor, pray for me this morning. Amen. 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 
Lord, if there's someone here this morning who said, Pastor, I don't know that I have a home in heaven. I'm not sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, others, would you pray for me as well? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you this morning. Slip your hand, slip back down. Pastor, I'm not sure. I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Slip up, slip back down. We'll see you. Lord, would you guide this invitation? Lord, help us to walk in your spirit with your control, not in our anger. Lord, I pray for those who lifted a hand that they would bow their hearts to you in a knee. Lord, I pray if there's anyone among us here online who's never trusted you as their Savior, that they would do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand to our feet, the piano's already playing, the altar's open. You need to do business with God. You come forward now.